Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for Leadership Insight. Leadership Insight exists to give you access to top influencers so that you can make a greater difference. And maybe this is your first time joining us, but we wanted to let you know that we have had previous Leadership Insights, and you can access those at our website or at our YouTube channel. My name is Alexis Topolsky, and I serve as the Director of Administrative Services here at Faith Bible College International, and I'm delighted to tell you a little bit about Dr. Phil Cook, who will be joining us as our guest today. He is the co-founder and CEO of Cook Media Group in Los Angeles. He has produced media programming in nearly 70 countries and created many of the most influential, inspirational TV programs in history with a client list that includes Hollywood studios, major nonprofit organizations, and many of the most respected churches and ministries in the world. His latest book, Ideas on a Deadline, How to Be Creative When the Clock is Ticking. He's been called one of the most innovative communicators of our generation. Before we get started, I just wanna point out a few things for our live conversation. We encourage you to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to communicate and interact with one another during the webinar. Introduce yourselves, where you're from, uh, and even the company or organization that you uh, serve at. Make sure you turn that chat on so that everyone can view it, not just the moderators. As well, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of the webinar, so make sure you use the question button to ask your questions for Dr. Full Cook and Dr. Ward. At the end of today's webinar, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar as well as a brief survey, and we would appreciate your feedback on this survey so that we can continually improve our Leadership Insight webinars. It is my privilege to now introduce to you Dr. Matthew Ward, the president of Faith Bible College International, who will be hosting our live conversation with Dr. Phil Cook. Hey, welcome everybody to Leadership Insight. Uh, we're so grateful for your being a part of this. And I know that what we talk about today is gonna be vitally important, not just for you, but for the people that you get to reach out to. Now, I just would remind you that we have built this uh, opportunity for the, both our college students and for those of us that are friends of Faith Bible College International so that you could sit down with our guests and ask them questions. So use that opportunity. I don't know how many times you're going to get to sit with Phil Cook, uh, but this is your opportunity to ask him questions that pertain to you. And we'll do our very, I promise we'll do our best to uh, get as all of those, as many of those questions that is in as possible. And I know it'd be a great blessing to you. And again, stay on after we're done with the interview. I'm going to give you some instructions and we're going to give away one of our new leadership insight books to uh, someone who fills out the survey. We always want to do better. We want to serve you with uh, this ministry. And so you can help us with that. With that, I want to welcome uh, Phil Cook to join us today. Phil, if, if uh, you'd like to join us here, uh, and we're going to talk about some great uh, things that God is doing in not only in media, but uh, through our students and our young leaders. And uh, so, hey, good morning, Phil. There you, you go. There you go. You look wide awake, bright eyed. Uh, it's I mean, a miracle. You must have had at least 10 or 12 hours of sleep. Not quite, not quite. We had a pretty rough, the last two days were pretty rough and I just barely got in. We arrived last night at, after midnight and I got out this morning at six. So if I, if I ramble aimlessly or get off, get off track, just yell at me and I'll get back on. <laughs> you mean to tell me the glamorous life of Phil Cook uh, doesn't <laughs> always go as, as you plan? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. We, I, I was in a meeting in the Midwest. Um, I, I flew out two days ago had meetings all day, let's see, actually three days ago, day before yesterday, had meetings all day, and it was snowing, and it was sleeting, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a catastrophe yet, but it was pretty rough, and so yesterday morning, I was scheduled to come back, because I wanted to prep, I have plenty of time to prepare for this, and um, flights just started getting canceled, snow hit Dallas, where I was connecting, uh, snow was just sleet was everywhere, and so flight got canceled, got canceled, got canceled, and I was starting to panic, I spent most of the day in my hotel room trying to 
talked to the airline. Then I went to the airport about five hours early and I sat out there and I was able to get the very last flight out. So fortunately it came straight to LAX and I got here after midnight. But, you know, as we were talking this morning, there's a real leadership lesson there. And that is, you know, when I was in film school, I assumed I'll spend my career on film sets with glamorous people coming up with brilliant ideas and being extremely creative my whole life. But I didn't realize that you're really going to spend most of your time in the trenches, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a ministry leader, whether you're a business leader or nonprofit leader, you're going to spend most of your time in the trenches. And I'm actually, I'm pretty convinced that, you know, right now we're going through a period of real burnout, particularly among pastors and ministry leaders. And I have a feeling it's because their expectations going in was just off base. They didn't realize we're going to spend, you know, I'm going to spend most of my time in the trenches doing day-to-day -day boring stuff. I'm, I'm constantly out there pitching, asking for money. I'm in the office. I'm traveling. I live on airplanes. And, um, I just think there's a real leadership lesson that you need to brace yourself because most of your career, whatever you choose, is going to be in the trenches. It's not going to be on those those mountaintops that we envision when we start our ministry career. So it, it's a, it was a good little lesson for me, a good reminder for me last night. And uh, But by the grace of God, here I am, and so I'm ready. You know, it, it seems like the most of the burnout comes from consistent frustration. And it seems yeah. like frustration comes when we have unmet expectations. And I, I love what you're saying because <clears throat> it's just part of the process. It doesn't mean that it's what we want to get done won't get done. Yeah. And it doesn't mean other people haven't gone through it. Like every, you had to go through this, it, not just oh, this, yeah. but I can imagine you, the surprises that you've had on set. <laughs> I tell you about eight or nine years ago, we'll give you a little behind the scenes secret here. About eight or nine years ago, I mean, I travel so much. So far in 2022, um, this, this uh, I mean, 20, yeah, 2022, this past year, I traveled 350,000 miles. Um, I could have gone around the world five or six times probably. And um, that, that I just live on planes. And about eight or nine years ago, I actually started to have a meltdown. And I thought, if I have to get on another plane, I'm going to kill myself. And it was like, it was as if God spoke to me very clearly and said, yeah, but you have no other skills. This is all you know how to do. And uh, it was a it was a bracing, sobering moment. And I realized, oh, yeah, you know what? He's right. So I, uh, I, I it was funny. I, I embraced it. I bought nice luggage because I live in my suitcase and my briefcase. I live in it. So I, I spent some money, got nice luggage. I joined the airline club because that's where I spend an enormous amount of time. And I, it can be private and quiet. And I can do a lot of work there. And so I just embraced it. And now I, I've completely turned. And I actually, if I'm spending a few days at home, I start to get bored and, and start looking at airplanes and start uh, wondering where I should be. So that's just, it's just interesting when it, your perspective is what matters, I think. And that's, God just needs sometimes to give us a wake up call, change our perspective. And that changes everything. Yeah, and Sam Chan just speaks so well about leadership pain. The people oh, yeah. that deal with the pain of leadership are the ones who succeed. Um, every year we do, as all families, most families do, a Christmas picture with my wife, our children, now our grandson. And, and you look at the picture and you would think, like, it's almost as good as the picture that's in the frame that we buy from Walmart that's on our bedroom wall that we don't know who the family is. And... And people say, oh, what a beautiful family. But if they only saw how much we hated each other getting ready for that picture. Yes. And, you know, my wife wanted to call the divorce lawyer and I wanted to give the kids back. But totally. we all got it together. And that one snapshot is is a reality, but it's not all the reality. And and I think it's so good what you're saying is that students need to have this opportunity to see the snapshot's great. It's worth it. The snapshot is worth it. Well, but the process, you got to go through you're it. right. You're right. And, and I think you're on, you, you know, we're onto something here because I, I'm, I'm going to take a, take a bold step here and maybe alienate some people, but I'm not a passion person. I, I'm one of these people that says, don't follow your passion. And, I, and I'll tell you why it's interesting. Um, I, I'm, I prefer to figure out what we're really wired to do. And I think that's what God's God works with. I think what, what are we really wired to do? For, for instance, I get screenplays uh, sent to me from writers, Christian writers uh, pretty frequently. And they'll send a letter that said, Phil, I'd love for you to read my screenplay. I'm really passionate about writing. Well, it doesn't take me but a few pages to realize they may be, may be passionate, but they're terrible at it. They're just terrible at it. And, um, 
I find so many people are passionate about something they're just not good at doing. And so I'm a big believer in figuring out what you're wired to do. I wrote a book years ago called One Big Thing, Discovering What You Were Born to Do. And that's really my philosophy in a nutshell. I think we're all called to do something really spectacular and God wired us to do it. Um, a good example is I was, oh, me, me, a number of years ago, uh, about midway through my career, I was filming, I was doing a film, directing a film in uh, Italy. And um, I remember doing a scene and it was three in the morning and I'm filming a scene on the side of a mountain in rural Italy. It's pouring down raining. It's freezing. I'm absolutely miserable. We're standing there soaking wet, three in the morning, exhausted, just miserable, freezing to death, shooting this scene. And the thought occurred to me that I'm having the time of my life. I, I don't know where, I, there's no place I would have rather been at that moment than right there in all of that misery. And I think that's what happens when you're doing what you're really called to do and what God wired you to do. So it does, you know, the pain doesn't matter if, if that's what God's called you to do. And, and uh, you're really created for that. And you figure all that out. Uh, it, 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 ultimately the pain doesn't matter because you push through it because you love it so much. So I think there's a word, there's a leadership word there that, you know, don't, don't worry less about what you feel passionate about. I mean, obviously passion is important, but let me tell you, you figure out what you're really wired to do. And let me tell you, you'll get passionate about that pretty quick. So um, that I, I had a dramatic lesson and many times I've had dramatic lessons many times in my career about that. So it's, it's a lesson for everybody listening, figure out what God really truly wired you to do and pursue that with everything you have. And I don't think you mind embracing the challenges when you know what it is. I read, I read that the one big thing, and it changed the way I did ministry a long time ago. Uh, as I told you before, we're, this Saturday here in Maine, it's going to be 60 degrees below zero. On Sunday, it's going to be 30. So we'll be wearing T-shirts on Sunday, man. It's going to be like summer. But, uh, I mean, we don't even put our jackets on until 20 below. And then when it's 50 below, we zip them up. Um, but you know what? For me personally, and we were talking about how that's not easy for everybody, but I know what I'm supposed to do. I kind of embrace it. Like I kind of yeah. like the challenge, the, the challenge of getting through a winner. And it's kind of the, whether it's right or we, just the way Mainers get through it. Um, when you <laughs> know what you're called to do. Yeah. You actually kind of, cause you know, that's where the great stories come from. Tell us, tell us the story about, because we have students here from Romania. Namibia, Liberia, yes. Haiti, uh, India, and one student just came as a freshman right now from Jamaica, which you can imagine what <clears throat> Maine winters like to a Jamaican. Uh, but I heard a story about a memorable helicopter ride you had that didn't go with plan. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, early in my career, it's funny you say that. I'm I'm I am a create. I'm driven by creativity. That's what inspires me. It's what fires me up. And and ch creative challenges. They don't, you know, they don't get me down. They just get me excited. And um, we were filming early in my career. I was asked to go film a big evangelic, evangelistic uh, campaign in, in Kingston, Jamaica. And the final night, it was scheduled for a big evangelistic outreach in the, the National Stadium in Kingston. And during the day, I went over there, set up our gear and get set up. We were going to film it. And I realized pretty quick, this place is going to be packed. It's going to be absolutely packed. And I thought, the only way to really capture this is from the air. And this is before drones. This is early in my career before anybody had invented drones. And the only way to get those shots was helicopters. And I, I took a quick check and there was no helicopter company, no rental helicopters on Jamaica at that time. And somebody suggested that the, the Red Stripe Beer Company had a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, which was my preference. When I filmed, I've done aerial filming all over the world, and that was a great, a great aircraft. And so I thought, mm hmm. So I jumped in the car and I raced across the island and I went to the Red Stripe company and I actually talked them into letting me have their helicopter for an hour. And um, it wasn't rigged for filming, it was just a normal helicopter. So the pilot was very gracious. He took the chair, some of the chairs out took the side door off and I sat literally on the floor on the side with my feet on the runners outside the helicopter. And, um, he took a rope, you know, normally we have a harness that you put, put, they put you in. And back in those days, cameras were huge, they're big old cameras. And, um, I just sat there on the side and he tied me in with a rope and we were going to go get that shot. 
and um, none of us, neither one of us, the pilot or I in our haste, we were hurrying because the crusade was about to start. Um, we didn't notice that there was a couple big loops in the rope. And um, so when we took off, he turned really sharp to go out across the bay, Kingston Bay. And I literally slid out of it. I mean, I was dangling by the rope. And, um, you know, th those are moments, <laughs> those are get right with God moments. And but, but, but I'll tell you what, this is when, this is, Matthew, this is when you know you're called. As I was dangling from the helicopter. All I could think of was keep the shot in focus. Just keep the shot in focus. That's when you know you're called. And um, anyway, he, he was a brilliant pilot and he saw what was going on. And of course, I'm yelling. And so he jerked the, jerked the helicopter back really hard, literally flung me back into the helicopter. And um, I mean, any harder than I probably hit the blades, but he flung me back in the helicopter. I started retying that rope like a crazy person. And um, we went on, I got it redone. We went on and we were doing corkscrews and things looking straight down at that, that stadium. And it was amazing. So I, I definitely got the shot, but those are moments where you definitely get right with God. And uh, it was, it was interesting. And fortunately I've had a career of those kind of moments and uh, God has done some amazing things with it. So I survived. I survived. I'm glad you lived to tell it. <laughs> uh, so you have a PhD in theology. And yeah, we, we had a student here at, at, at one time who had graduated from a globally known Bible college, a great Bible college. So I asked the, I asked the student, I said, well, I'm glad you're here, but why are you here? The student said, I don't know my theology. And, and, I, and I began to realize, you know, how this generation is hungry to know good doctrine. You, you, but you have a PhD in theology, but you're not necessarily like, preaching from no. a pulpit, a natural pulpit every Sunday, but you've taken that PhD in theology and you've used it not just in a religious world, but in a secular world as well. How has that PhD in theology served you in your public life, in your vocation? Well, I'm a preacher's kid. I, I grew up a, a pastor's son, and um, I, I never had a moment's calling or a moment's desire to preach, but I just grew up in that world. My dad had a massive library, so I grew up reading. And he had two PhDs, brilliant, brilliant guy, fought the Japanese during World War II uh, in the Pacific Theater for the Marines, um, just an amazing man, Golden Gloves boxer, got called into the ministry, just had a real passion for learning. And um, I grew up in that kind of atmosphere. And so as I, as, as I was developing my career, I just, have, I mean, I love being a student. I just always love being a student. I actually have a a plaque on my desk with a quote from Michelangelo that said, I'm still learning. And I'm thinking, if Michelangelo, po possibly the greatest artist in the history of the world, could say that at, at the peak of his powers, maybe I could still be learning too. And um, I got my master's, it's weird, I got a master's in journalism because I knew I wanted to write from the University of Oklahoma. And uh, a, a number of years later, I thought, let me just keep pushing. And, and I wanted to be able to speak the language of my clients. Most of, you know, our team at Cook Media Group is a production consulting company when it comes to television, film, sh social media, all kind of uh, media things, me media projects. And um, we deal mostly with churches and ministry organizations. We just have a passion to help the church tell their story more effectively. Um, I just find that I think one of the reasons Christianity is disappearing from our culture, one of the reasons we're failing as a church is that uh, we don't know how to tell our story in the digital culture we live in. Digital is the language this culture speaks today. And if we don't speak that language, we're going to fail. So the bottom line is we work with mostly pastors and ministry leaders for a living. And I just want to be able to communicate, speak their language. And, uh, and, and of course, I just love theology. It's, it's funny. You'll get a kick out of this. I, I did my doctoral dissertation on the movie Shawshank Redemption. Kind of freaked out my theology professors, but I got an A. And um, so it was. I just wanted to be able to mix film, television with theology in a way that would help us figure out, okay, how as Christians, how as Christians do we speak that language more effectively and ultimately impact the culture? So that's why I got, I don't, I mean, I've taught, I've been a guest lecturer in, in a range of colleges from Christian colleges like Oral Roberts University and Regent and uh, Biola to secular colleges like University of California at Berkeley, UCLA. I've done guest lecturing, but I've never, I really don't have a desire to be a full-time professor. Um, I just love studying theology. And, and you're onto something too, by the way. In my book, when, uh, uh, The Way Back, we discovered that 
Christians are remarkably ignorant of the Bible. It's, it's really staggering. We went to Pew, Gallup, Lifeway Research, and we discovered that 40% of Christians in the pew on a typical Sunday, 40%, almost half, read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. And we wonder why we're not making a bigger impact in our culture today. In fact, Lifeway did a survey. I wrote a blog post about this on my blog at philcook.com. I wrote a post a few weeks ago. Lifeway did a survey that 73% of Christians in the pews on Sunday, in church on Sunday, have such wrong beliefs that they could actually be considered heretics. And so as Christians, we just don't, we've not really we don't really read the Bible. We don't really know the Bible. And I think it's a big part of why we're failing as a cult in the culture today. Sorry, I didn't mean to preach on that, but it's a big, it's a big issue with me. You're with the right crowd. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I love what is going on here at, at Faith Bible College International. That's all we do is produce people, uh, ministers. And it, all those stats are lay at the feet of the pulpits because as the pulpit goes, the church goes. Um, and it's so exciting to be able to be a part of something here that's training men and women to go out there who know what the Bible says. And it's not outdated. People are hungry for that. If we can, like you said, if we can get, if we communicate to our generation. So, so let me let me take the current low mileage Bill Cook and uh, take him and make him a student at Faith Bible College International. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, with your current experience, what would you want to be learning about digital media, social media, media in general? That's a great question. You know, I think uh, pastors from this point on, pastors, church leaders, worship leaders, teachers, for them not to say, we, I don't do social media, is going to be like a previous generation of pastors saying, I don't do books. It's just, it would, it, it'll be, it'll seem ridiculous in the future. So, and, I, and I'm not saying it's, we have to do social media. We have to be a part of that because there's a lot of dangerous things with it as well. But at the same time, we've got to be able to engage with people on that level. That's one of the reasons why when the churches were shut down during the pandemic, uh, we, we'd been preaching live streaming for, you know, 10, 15 years before that. And we'd work with, We'd been working for a long time before the pandemic, helping churches really tweak their live stream to make it an amazing experience. Because I don't, Matthew, I don't believe it's an either or. You know, so many people say, Phil, you know, we need to get people in church. Well, fine, I'm, I'm all for that. But there's a lot of people that aren't going to come to your church that will engage with you online first. We're seeing, for instance, for instance, we're seeing that this generation wants to check you out online before they come and visit. In fact, I, one of the things, I, I, one of my big, big messages is why, you know, if, if, if the vast majority of people today want to check you out online before they visit, why is your website so lame? I'll tell you, church websites are terrible. For the most part, they're just terrible. And yet we know that's the gateway to help people decide whether or not they're going to come and visit your church. So that's just one example of how pastors should do it. And I, I'll tell you, I've seen so many examples of people accepting Christ, finding a church, getting healed, just getting delivered in so many ways, just from a connection they made through social media or online in some way through Facebook or even TikTok or, or, or Twitter. It's just remarkable. So I just think we need to understand how that works if we're going to be effective in the 21st century. It's interesting to me that Paul, the Apostle Paul, used the technology of his day, which was letters, to really build the foundation of the early church. And then in the 1500s, this obscure monk nobody ever knew about in Germany named Martin Luther discovered the power of publishing. You know, the, the, the printing press had just been invented. And he, you know, a lot of people saw it and didn't really respond to it, but he saw it and had a vision for what it could do. And he in, ended up being the most, most read author of his time. He was the best-selling author of his day because he embraced the printing press. He hired Lucas Cranach, who was the leading artist of his time to create book covers. It's that's an interesting story. Um, but in, in Martin Luther's time, a typical book cover just had the title of the book on it. It was just typed on there, had type typography, the title of the book. That was it. He started creating really interesting, engaging book covers. 
And so he just embraced that technology and became the best-selling author in the, in the known world at the time. So I think we would be fools today not to embrace technology. You know, it's interesting, Matthew, that at the turn of the last century, between about 1898 and 1914, at the birth of the movie industry, the church actually made more movies than Hollywood. Uh, film scholars today will say the church really embraced movies early on. I was at a church uh, in Mont Mont uh, Montclair, New Jersey, just across the, the Hudson River from New York City. They asked me to come in and help them. They wanted to do some video and give them some advice. And it was a historic church. It was built in 1911. Henry Emerson Fosdick founded the church. And um, they were renovating one of the back walls of the church, of the sanctuary, they opened it up and discovered a gigantic vintage 35 millimeter movie projector hidden away inside the back wall of the church. And they started researching it and they discovered back in 1910, 1920, every, every uh, Friday night, they would have movie night at the church and invite the community in to watch films. And it was a powerful, powerful evangelistic tool. But then they started getting away from that and it got less popular. And so they ended up, it was, less expensive just to board up the projector into the wall than it was to pull it out. So, but it's a great example. I've seen that at churches all over the country that we really embraced film early on, but then as films got more secular, more profane, more violence, more sex, the church kind of pulled back. And whenever you pull back, you know, a vacuum happens and the wrong elements go in. So I just think that we've had such a great history of embracing technology and I think we should do it again. I think we really need to understand the power of social media, the power of technology, the power of digital, you know, of film and video. I think that's just really critical. If Paul Cook were to attend Faith Bible College International, yep. graduate from Faith Bible College International, and you were either starting a new work or taking a church that kind of needed to be renewed or revived. Let, let me ask you two questions. What okay. percent of your budget would you want to put into your media? And two, what media platform would you go on first? Um, it's interesting. Um, when, I, when the pandemic was happening and, and churches couldn't meet, I actually did a Zoom training session with 50 pastors who were planting churches 100% online during the pandemic. They okay. figured we wow. can't have a building, we can't bring people in, so we're going to still, we're, that's not going to stop us. We're going to plant a church. So let me just say, you could do some amazing things with no building at all. And here, this would be my advice. Um, I would start, certainly start live streaming where, wherever you are. I'm one of these guys that tends to say, you know, what did the Apostle Paul say? I want to I want to go where nobody's been before. I want to start a work that's not been done. I, I want to pioneer a church somewhere that needs it desperately. And so I tend to want to start, but that's not to say taking over a church is, is a bad thing. Moving into an existing church is a bad thing. Certainly there's so much you could learn by being on staff for a number of years at a, at a, at a, you know, a, a really significant church, an effective church. But I like starting um, by myself out there. And I think that it's important to, um, there, there's tools like Life Church in Oklahoma City has, you know, their church online program, they can provide tools to create a live stream that are all free. It doesn't cost you anything to do it. And so I would start there probably. You could or start on Facebook. You can go on Facebook Live. You can go on Instagram Live. You can go on YouTube Live. There's so many ways out there that you can actually start live streaming a church. And what we discovered during the pandemic was pa pastors and leaders were doing it from their home. I'm sitting right now at a kind of a high bistro table on a stool. A lot of them would do that, set up a camera. I know one guy that literally taped his iPhone to a two by four and would, would preach to that every Sunday. And so you could be innovative in so many different ways. I think the important thing is just to be out there and connecting with people. Um, as far as the budget is concerned, I would want to put a lot of my budget into online digital media. One of the things we're discovering is short films. Now short videos, two to four minute videos are the number one marketing tool in America right now. More secular companies, more nonprofits, more churches are using short video to tell their story. One of our clients is the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And I, I would highly encourage your students and anybody watching this to go to the Museum of the Bible in D.C. And it's an absolutely life-changing experience. But we've done literally hundreds. We started filming there before groundbreaking. And we, we, we had a 
a crew on site every month for three and a half years while they were building. Then we've been back many, many, many times filming different stories for them. And we've done hundreds of short videos helping tell their story. And I constantly get emails and uh, messages from people all over the world that are seeing those stories that are out there. Because once they get out there, they just go crazy. So uh, I think there's so many ways to engage with people. And you don't need a fancy film crew like we have to do that. You know what? I, I, my belief is today everybody carries a video studio in their, their pocket. The 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 phones, the typical phone we carry around today is better than the quarter of a million dollar camera I started working with 30 or 40 years ago. So th there are actually two film festivals in America now for movies shot on iPhones. So don't tell me you don't have the budget. Don't tell me you don't have the resources. Take your phone, get out there and start making a film. It's just amazing what you can do online and getting the in getting the message out there. So there's just so many options, so many things to do. I, in fact, I wrote a book called Maximize Your Influence that was really designed to be a textbook for pastors to understand how this digital world works, what I need to know about preaching to a digital generation, our website, our social media, all those tools. It's all in there. So uh, I think there's just so many opportunities and for us not to take advantage of, uh, of it, it's just a shame. I would encourage everybody to get that maximize your influence book because you don't have it's not you don't have to read through the whole book. You can just take yeah. information for what you're interested as at the time and just apply it to your need at, at that moment. So good. So good. Yeah. I, I've got some questions coming in from uh, some of the viewers. Uh, the first one is with media, should there be more produced content or raw media, such as selfie videos, live streams, et cetera? or a balance of both, what would you recommend? I would try to do a balance of both, but here's the thing. If you don't have the tools or the expertise or the talent um, to do finished, you know, high quality content, start, you know, doing lives, you know, do, do, a, do an Instagram video, start on Facebook, doing a live Facebook event, uh, little things like that. We do live in a generation where people are so used to seeing content created from a phone that they're used to it being rough around the edges. It doesn't have to be really polished. It can be rather raw. In fact, I think to a certain degree, being raw gives it a certain authenticity. So, um, you know, the, the truth is most, most high school kids today know how to edit video. And so it's not that hard to find a, a young person who really understands how to do that. So you could do a lot of finished things, a lot of nice, complete little videos, teaching series, things like that. However, um, I think sometimes those moments, what, what leaders learn early on in an office is that very often just a random engage, you know, engaging randomly with an employee at the coffee machine, some kind, sometimes can be far more significant than having an organized meeting. And I think it's the same on social media. Uh, we don't always have to do finished, brilliant, brilliantly done videos, sometimes just picking it up and sharing and a live Instagram moment or just creating a little video and then just, you know, cleaning it up a little bit and sending it out. Sometimes that can have an enormous consequence and be very powerful. So don't be afraid to do it. Um, get it out there. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I would sit, my caution would be make sure it's not about you. One of the things that bugs me about social media is we do live, live in this self centered world. I was on a flight recently set next to a girl probably, I don't know, maybe 25 years old. She's sitting next to the window and it was a four hour flight. She literally probably took 400 selfies on that flight. She would raise the window to get a little more light and, and take a few. Then she'd lower the window a little bit. Then she'd change her hair. I mean, literally she took 400 selfies, totally unaware of me sitting there, totally unaware of everybody else on the plane. She, you know, that's the world we live in today. So I would say if you're in ministry, it's about other people. It's not about you. So um, focus on other people, not not necessarily you all the time. That would make a big difference. And, and I love the story brand idea, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. You know, make the people the hero. Don't make yourself the hero. Uh, yeah. Make it about the people. That, that, that right there is gold. Thank you so much. Uh, another question comes in. <clears throat> How would we take our church or ministry media from a mediocre level to the next level with creative ideas and reach a lot of people? Okay, that's a great question. And, and my, my advice is you need to start by creating a creative culture in your church. You know, you and I have talked about this, Matthew, a number of times. 
And I think creating a creative culture in your church is absolutely critical. You want to make sure creative people are welcome at your church, feel comfortable at your church, and want to do some amazing things. I mean, here's the thing. Um, remember, as a pastor, you're preaching to the people you see. You're preaching to people in the congregation. And if it's a small church, it may be 20 people. It may be 50 people or 100 people. But a creative communicator in your church can help you take that message and literally make it available to millions of people out there. So yeah. the more you encourage a creative environment in your church, and let me give you a couple tips that I think are really, really important for that. Um, you know, number one, be on the lookout for creative people in your congregation. Look for young people that have that spark, that maybe are musical, that maybe, you know, really love, are always shooting pictures or video that love social media, they're probably influences in your congregation that you don't even know about. There may be a high school kid that has more followers than you've ever dreamed of having. Start mm -hmm. cultivating those relationships, make them feel welcome. And to do that, you've got to, you've got to be fairly flexible. You know, creative people aren't like accountants. They're not like attorneys, creative people or, or salespeople. They're a little different. And some like to keep rock star hours and work all night. Um, I'm a morning person from 6 a.m. to noon. Man, I'm wildly creative. Afternoon, I'm I can do meetings, I can teach, I can you know fly to places. But as far as intense creative work, forget it. After lunch, I'm wasted. So I think understand when they're really good. We all live with circadian rhythms, so you know a certain part of the day I'm amazing during that part of the day. During the rest of the day, I'm not, or vice versa. So find out and be flexible with those guys. And when you hire creative people. Make it a stable situation. Obviously, you're pioneering a church. You may be a small church, but as much as possible, make it stable. Creative people do not do well when they're threatened. You know, if you go to a designer, for instance, and you say, look, if you don't get that, that design done, that logo done, we're going to be out of business. You know, they're going to start getting nervous and they're not going to unleash their the potential of their creative power. So you need to kind of make them feel comfortable, make them feel stable. Um, if you can do that, they'll do remarkable things. And as much as possible, get them the tools they need. If you've got a designer, get in the latest Mac. Obviously, we have budget constraints. We're certainly, even with our team at Cook Media Group, we're constantly battling budget issues. But as much as possible, I want to get my people the tools they need because I'd rather them spend their time creating amazing things than spend their time fixing their old beat up computer. So um, get them the tools they need. And another thing is challenge them and walk away. Let them do their thing. Don't micromanage. I posted on, on Instagram just yesterday, I posted a picture of a woman weeping saying, my pastor thinks he's a graphic designer. Um, it was hilarious. And there's so many pastors that want to approve everything. You know, if you've hired that person because they're creative, let them be creative. Let them do their right. thing. Obviously you have input, you have approval and everything, but and, and the last thing I would say, and this is true as you grow and become a bigger church is understand, and this is probably the most important thing, understand the difference between organizational structure and communication structure. And I'm, I'm, let me explain, because I think it's so critical. Organizational structure matters. You know, who reports to who, that, that's important. What department reports to who, uh, that's important. However, when it comes to communication, your church, your ministry, your business, needs to be very free flowing. You know, go back to that graphic designer. If they're designing a new logo for the church and they have to go through five layers of approval to get to the pastor who's the final sign off, you know what? Everybody's going to contribute and that's that logo is going to be a monstrosity by the time it gets to the pastor. <laughs> Plus it's going to take, you know, 9 months to get there because everybody's going to have their little two cents and they're going to they're, they're going to make changes. He's got to go back to the drawing board or she. And so let that graphic designer go directly to the pastor when he or she needs to, you know, ha have a free flowing communication flow that will really energize your church and transform it. So those are some things there's, there's other issues, but making a creative culture in many ways will be the most important thing you do as a leader, because that sets the stage for everything else. So good. And, and you did a great job giving us information on that. I would say all the viewers, the Leadership Insight book, uh, Phil Cook put a chapter in this, 10 keys to building that culture. And that alone is so incredibly valuable, along with the other insights that he gives us in there. So there's a link there if you want to get a hold of the Leadership Insight book. You cover the cost of getting it to you, we'll give it to you. 
because we, we believe that this information will help you. Okay, what would you recommend for social media reels? Social media reels as far as someone trying to get a job in social media or what? what um... I think I think it's, it says R-E-E-L-S. So I'm thinking like the video reels, like you sent me a, a media reel yeah. advertising this yeah. event. Well, um, I think I, I, that, go ahead, go ahead. Cause I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know if they're meaning like the, how useful they are or how, if they're the most impacting way to advertise right now or not. Um, I think, let me take a couple stabs. I may not hit the, hit the target here, but let me, t- let me do a couple different things. One is if you want to be a social media person or you want to be a video producer or a video director, if you want to be a, a professional communicator like me, um, reels are super important and not just a chopped up version of all the things you've done to a rock and roll tune. Um, I think show people completed pieces. They want to know that you know how to tell a story. So whenever we're talking to a new client, I want to send them samples of our work. I'll send them 10 or 12 different, <clears throat> different completed little short video pieces we've done for different ministry organizations around the world. That lets them see we know how to tell a story. We know how to do a complete piece. It really helps and, and shows them from different perspectives. Um, as far as if you want to use social media as a ministry leader, um, I think you should be on multiple platforms. Uh, you know, here, here's the thing to realize with social media, and that is Every platform has a different audience. You know, Twitter is largely leaders. When, I, when I'm looking at my Twitter feed, there are pa- I see pastors, I see CEOs, I see thought, you know, influencers, I see uh, people that are really brilliant, creative people on Twitter. The, the, the leaders are on Twitter. Facebook is more friends and family. You know, I can say something on Twitter that's very profound and people lo- love it and they'll discuss it. I say the same thing on Facebook, it drops like a brick. Um, Instagram is Twitter driven visually. So Instagram, I get really interesting comments from, from Instagram. However, I also tell people disregard everything I say about social media when it comes to my Instagram feed. I just, I just have fun with it. It's, it's my playground and um, it's my therapist. So, you know, go to my Instagram feed just for fun. Um, But it, it can be a very powerful tool of starting conversations. And I think that's the thing. You don't need to preach on social media. You don't need to criticize. You don't need to be snarky. You don't, you know, don't be a jerk. Christians should never be a jerk on social media. If the gospel drives people away, so be it. But if you drive people away because you are kind of hard headed, you're a jerk, you are snarky, making fun of people on social media, if that drives them away, you've made a terrible, terrible mistake. So you want to be engaging. You want to bring up difficult questions. Um, Those kind of things are really, really critical on social media. So I don't know if either one of those answers help, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. They did. I think that's a bullseye, to be honest with you. Great job. Uh, What type of content have you seen be the most engaging, such as videos, live streams, selfie videos, et cetera? What type of content do you think is the most engaging? All right. First of all, listen to this very carefully, everybody out there. Um, Facts are for print. Video is about emotion. So if you have, if if your church feeds, you know, a thousand people a week, if it takes in homeless people, if you've had, you know, 500 people saved this year at your church, whatever, great. But put it on, put it in a pamphlet, put it in a brochure, put it on the website. I see videos all the time that people send me with statistics and the impact they've made. Nobody cares. Video, if you do a video, I don't want to see the statistics. I want to see the story of one life that was transformed because of the work you do. That's the story. And that's what will engage people. That will grab their heart. And so understand when you make a video, don't make the video as a factual presentation about anything. Make the video as an emotional presentation and tell someone's story. That's really, if you don't listen to anything else I say today, understand that. Facts are for print. Video is for emotion. And so um, use it that way. And in that respect, short videos can be insanely powerful tools. And one of the things I would urge you to start with is your origin story, how your church got started, how you got saved, how God delivered you from alcoholism or whatever it might be. Um, One thing we know people love are origin stories. In the collector's comic book world, if you look at comic books, I was a big comic book reader when I was a kid. And today, if you look at the collector market for comic books, 
by far the most expensive and valuable comics are origin stories. How Iron Man got started, how Batman got started, how Spider-Man got started. That's the most valuable. People love origin stories. And um, so don't be afraid to over and over and over tell your story. And by the way, over and over and over is important. Don't worry about reposting the same thing. You don't have to do it right afterwards, but you know, you know, every few weeks, go back and repost some of your old stuff. Think of so to, so, uh, social media as a stream, not a pond. It's constantly changing. Uh, new people are coming on. Not everybody's on all the time. So if you never go back and post some of your greatest hits, there's tons of people that will never see it. So don't be afraid. I tell, I tell even television ministries that do television, Christian TV, rerun, rerun like crazy. You know, statistics are nobody's watching every single program you produce. So if you're not rerunning it, actually, you're playing it for the first time for a huge number of your audience. So always think about saving your best stuff, using it again, because always think of social media, video, television. That's a stream, not a pond. It's always changing and always flowing. That's so good. What equipment would you recommend for making videos on social media with your phone? What have you found that works best for you? Well, it's uh, if you're making videos with your phone, which I highly recommend. I mean, I use a DSR a lot. We use a lot of sophisticated cameras because the the broadcast quality uh, of projects that we do, either we want our projects to be shown in a film theater or, or on broadcast. However, uh, there's a, a surprising number of feature films made with iPhones now. In fact, I, I you know, I, I talked to a director of photography, which is the person that, that films a movie the other day, a woman who's very talented. And she only, she, she makes a living in Hollywood shooting A-list commercials, movies, the whole thing. And all she shoots on is an iPhone 14. And um, so you need your normal lighting, lighting matters. You need to think about lighting, you know, when you're shooting these things, you know, and, and when you think about lighting, think in terms of what you don't show is just as important as what you show. You don't want to really focus on the actors or the speaker, the teacher, whatever you're doing. So lighting really does matter. Good audio is important. Many, many movies, short videos fail because they didn't have good audio. And you can go on Amazon and easily find lavalier microphones, handheld microphones that just plug right into your, your iPhone. And so there's so many cheap, inexpensive tools you can get to do really professional quality stuff. Keep in mind, phones are shooting 4K these days. And so if you've got a phone in your pocket, you've got a video studio already started. So think about that. You really don't need, in most cases, you don't need really expensive video gear to launch a video ministry. So good. Got a couple good questions here for you left. Uh, okay. is, it, is it good to show our ministry updates on social media, like posting our ministry pictures? Let me tell you this. If you don't show what your ministry does to your congregation, your donors, your partners, it never happened. So when you take a, a team to Mexico to build houses for, you know, families down there, you need somebody filming that. Not just taking still photos, but filming it. Do interviews with them. Have people talk about how much this means to them. Have someone telling the story. And then you bring that back and you put it together and you show that to your congregation. Let me tell you, they'll get excited about it. But if you don't, it might as well have never happened. If they don't know about it, what's the point? So we just live in a world where, and this is why I have a job, quite frankly. I work with major nonprofit, like the Salvation Army is a client of ours. And the Salvation Army does amazing stuff. But in many cases, they're really good at doing amazing stuff. They're not good at telling their story. They, they weren't trained, you know, Bible colleges, most, unlike Grace, Bible colleges don't talk to about communication and media and telling your story. So I make a living going out and hemp, helping them tell their story to the world. And donors need to know about it. The public needs to know about it. Supporters need to know about it. Prayer warriors need to know about it. So I just encourage you, get out there, get those stories out, start telling people about what you do. And it's not about bragging. It's just about letting people know what God's doing through your ministry. Sure. That's the key. That's the critical key. Sure. We read it through the whole book of Acts. They were just yeah. telling what's happened. What's That's going what on Luke in the did. industry? <clears throat> what Luke That's did. Right. You're exactly right. Uh, how can I best minister? This is a really good question. How can I best minister to people in foreign countries using Zoom or other media? 
Let me tell you, this is really interesting. We, for many, many years, we have gotten so many requests to teach Christians internationally about media that we finally, about 10 years ago, launched a little nonprofit called the Influence Lab. And um, we just couldn't c continue pay for it, paying for it ourselves. And we've been all over the world. I was in two, two weeks ago, I was in Bangkok teaching 20 personally invited media leaders from all over Asia for a two-day intensive session with them. Uh, in November, I was in Seoul, South Korea. I'm going to be in Cape Town in March. Um, we're just constantly getting flooded with invitations. The hunger from Christians around the world to learn about social media is absolutely incredible. Give you one good example. Um, my book, you mentioned my book, uh, Maximize Your Influence. A, a church in Russia called um, about six months ago and said, you know what, your need, your book needs to get to pastors in Russia, you know, because of the situation they're in right now. It's such a struggle and so difficult in Russia. Evangelical pastors need to start, you know, they need to make an impact from the inside. And they said, we need to get your book into their hands. And so they raised the money at their church to translate it into Russian. And I'm now trying to raise money through our influence lab to have it distributed to about 12,000 evangelical pastors all over Russia. And so to help them learn how to use media to get the gospel out there online. And what an important time it is right now in Russia to make that happen. And so I just, I think it's, your, your question is incredibly important. When churches were shut down, I, I went on Zoom and I did a teaching session with 200 pastors across Russia. I did a, a live, had a live stream to 160 pastors in South America, 60 Portuguese spe speaking pastors in Portugal, Brazil, and Angola. Um, I did 200, uh, actually 400 pastors, two sessions of 200 each of pastors in Australia. And um, I just think, boy, that, that's the way to do it. Engage with people through Zoom. I, I, I just wore out Zoom during the pandemic, and you can still use it to do a lot of media training with people internationally and, and teaching the gospel, whatever. So, and, and here's the thing. It doesn't take a lot of people. You don't have to have a big audience. Remember, you know, with this Leadership Insight video, you guys are going to post it later. So we'll have people watch it live, but you'll have a whole lot more people watch it later on. So that's the power of video. It will just, once it's out there on YouTube or wherever, it's going to go on until Jesus comes. So I would encourage you, get out there, stop sharing the gospel, start engaging with people internationally, whether it's Zoom or video or whatever, YouTube, get out there because there's such a hunger for it. And by the way, you know, when you think about it by population, the largest country on the planet right now is Facebook. And the question is, who's sending missionaries to that country? Who's planting churches in that country? You know, let's, here's the thing I'd like you, I'd like to, to make sure everybody understands that let's stop thinking about missions just in terms of geographical boundaries and also start thinking about missions in terms of digital boundaries. You know, Facebook is a country we need to reach. We need to evangelize. Uh, Instagram is a country we need to reach. So what are we doing to take the gospel to those countries? Because they're so incredibly important to do. That's awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to I read. Love the point. No, it's so good. I, I love the point. You don't know who you're reaching. Like once it's out there, yes. who knows who it's going to touch. So man, I would love to close it if you would. And tell us yeah. that, that powerful story about the, the African minister that you met. Yeah, I was in my, back when I was in my 20s, I, I had the opportunity to go film, uh, document a, um, a big evangelistic effort in Africa. We were in South Africa, we were in Swaziland, we were in Uganda, and we, I was, had my, had my video crew and we were shooting this thing, and I, I came across a guy there named Nicholas Bingu, and he was a very, at the time, he was in his 70s at the time, he's long since passed away, but at the time, he was a very celebrated, honored African evangelist and time magazine actually called him the Billy Graham of Africa because he had reached more Africans for Christ than any man in history. And I thought, man, that, that's, it was just an amazing story. And I wanted so bad to interview Nicholas Bingu. So I finally, I, I worked with his people. We arranged it while we were there in Africa and I, I set up my camera, set up my lights and finally got him and the, his people brought him in. As I say, it was in his seventies at the time. So he was quite elderly, but they brought him in and I said, Nicholas, tell me about this. You've led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. Tell me about that story. And he was a super humble guy. And he said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you a different story. 
And he started telling me this story about this young couple, this missionary couple that, that came from the United States to Africa many, many years before. And he said they were very excited. Their denomination sent them over. They were super, you know, ready to go. They were ready to preach the gospel and be missionaries. He said the problem was apparently they, they, they just weren't very good at it. And so they would preach nobody would come. They would, nobody would accept Christ. I mean, they didn't get a single convert. They spent time in villages. They engaged with people. Nobody responded. Literally nobody responded. And years would go by and they would come home for furlough to raise money. Can you imagine how tough it would be to, to try to raise money for a mission that you didn't have a single convert, not one. And he said they went, but they were faithful and they went back and they preached. They, he said they built a church and nobody came. Nobody came to it. And he said, finally, after decades and decades in the field with not one single convert, he said, in fact, it was kind of funny. He said, the only person they made contact with at all was this little kid that helped them carry their gear. That was it. Finally, the denominational leaders started looking at this thinking, you know, this is kind of embarrassing. We can't keep supporting them. This is ridiculous. They're total failures. What are we doing? And so after all those decades in the field, the denomination called them home. And he said, back in those days, you traveled by boat. And he said, Literally, to, when they got on the boat, the only person after spending most of their adult life in the field, m the only person to see them off was that little kid helping them with their gear. That was it. So they came home completely humiliated, completely embarrassed, utter failures, utter failures. I mean, can you imagine what that would be like? And they were so embarrassed by it. When they got back, they retired. They, it wasn't but a few years before they both passed away. Utter, complete failures. And that's when Nicholas Bingo, Bingo leaned over to me and he said, but you know, Phil, what they didn't realize was I was that kid. And he said, the truth is God didn't send them to Africa to reach a thousand people or 500 people or a hundred people. He sent them over there to reach me. And since that time, I've led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. And I, oh man, that, that got me. And I, I, I think about that as a media producer. Every time I produce a program, I don't know who it's reaching. I don't know who's being touched by that television program or that film. It's hard to say. And so often we work so hard trying to share the gospel out there and don't know if we're getting any results at all. And I go back and I think, but there may be a Nicholas Bingu sitting out there watching. There may be a Nicholas Bingu listening. And if there's that one, that's really all it takes. And it's a really a reminder to me that it's not my job to keep score. It's my job to be faithful. And I'm just going to trust God to use that message once it goes out there and hopefully makes an impact. This has been so good. <clears throat> I, I want to end our time together and ask you to pray. Uh, we have leaders, pastors, alumni, and students that what you have said today has been so needed, so good, so clear, and... Uh, and so I just ask you to pray that God would help us all to do what he's called us to do with what he's put into our hands. Absolutely. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to share out of, out of my own experience and what you've done with, with our team. And I just pray that you would somehow start a little spark in people's lives who are listening about the power of media and what it can do to amplify that message of the gospel. I just thank you that you've given them the desire, the passion. You've helped them grow in knowledge of you. And now I pray that you would help them also understand that media can take that message and multiply it to so many more people. And I think you'd, I, I pray that you'd give them a, a real desire to learn, to grow. And, and as you know, God, technology changes, uh, media changes. Help us to always be students. Help us to never feel like we've arrived or we've learned enough or we've got it. That every day there's something new to learn. And I pray, and I thank you for that because we always want to grow and make a bigger impact in today's culture. So thank you for the people that made the effort to listen today. And I, I pray for people that will be listening in the future that you will really inspire in them a, a desire to use media to take your message to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for pushing through everything to even get here today. Oh, and, uh, just... Again, thanks for your, your, your graciousness to Faith Bible College International. You've been very kind, and uh, we pray that God will continue to use you and your ministry to reach the world. Well, I'm grateful to you. I thank you so much for, I love opportunities like this to share with, you know, I wish I had these kind of opportunities when I was in college, and uh, so I'm happy to do it, man. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Phil.
Well, <clears throat> first of all, students, <clears throat> you need to get online and start putting out some of your stories, some of your testimonies. You've got divine permission today. And pastors and leaders, uh, I know none of us feel like we're doing it the best that we can maybe, but let's just keep striving forward for the cause of Christ. Uh, if you would, please stay on the line. And uh, we have a short survey that if you would fill that out, every time you do that, that helps us do what we're doing better so that more leaders can be inspired and receive some insight. Again, like Phil said, not only what are you seeing is being viewed now, but uh, probably more people, obviously more people will be watching it later as this goes around the world. And so if you'll fill one out, we're gonna take a drawing and one of the folks that fill that survey out will get one of these books for free. We'll pay for the shipping, we've paid for the book and uh, we'll get that into your hands, be a great blessing to you. God bless you, stay, uh, Connected to us in April, our next Leadership Insight guest will be Doug Clay, the superintendent of the Assemblies of God. So stay in tune and write this date down, April the 20th. April the 20th, you must find a way, boat, car, truck, snowmobile, canoe, roller skates, I don't care what it is, hoverboard, get to Faith Bible College International, one day leadership conference with Sam Chan, go to the website, get registered, space is limited, and uh, th that's like a $900 value. Honestly, this conference is, I know it is because I've been to one of them, and uh, I think we're just charged enough to get you fed. So we want you to come. God bless you, and have a blessed day.